In our last video, we introduced the notion of continuity of a function at a point. So I wanna recall that really quick and then give an example of a function that is continuous everywhere and will prove that it is continuous everywhere and a function that is discontinuous everywhere and will prove that it is discontinuous everywhere. So the definition goes like this. A function f from a to r, where we're thinking about this capital A as being a subset of the real numbers, is continuous at a point little a and capital A if for every epsilon bigger than zero there is a delta bigger than zero such that for all x in a where the absolute value of x minus a is less than delta, we know that the absolute value of f of x minus f of a is less than epsilon. So in other words, any challenge that you give me and the epsilon is like this challenge, I can return a delta answer to that challenge so that the function value is within epsilon of f of a whenever x is within delta of a. So that's how you kind of want to think about that. And in a previous video, we proved that it was equivalent to this notion of sequential continuity. And this is actually something that's specially happening in the real numbers. It happens in lots of spaces, but not all spaces. And that says for all sequences x sub n inside of capital A that satisfy this rule where the limit as n goes to infinity of x sub n equals A, we have the limit as n goes to infinity of f of x sub n equals f sub A, or sorry, f evaluated at A. So I wanna point out here that this puts everything in terms of limits of sequences, whereas this is like the more standard epsilon delta definition. And we're actually gonna use each of these definitions uh, in the video today. So first we'll use the epsilon delta definition to show that f of x equals x squared is continuous at all x in R. So the, the way we want to do this is we're thinking about this a as being fixed and then with that fixed value of a we'll run through the challenge of having an epsilon and then the answer to that challenge of having a delta and we're actually going to be inspired by something that we saw before when we showed that the limit of x squared as x approached 5 was equal to 25 but i'll let you guys look that up to sort of see where our inspiration for this proof is okay so let's say that we are given epsilon bigger than zero Maybe we're gonna do some scratch work over here to get a feel for what's going on. So we want to have x squared minus a squared less than epsilon. So we wanna construct a delta so that that happens. But now notice we can go ahead and factor this uh, left-hand side. So that's gonna give us x minus a times x plus a is less than epsilon. But now what we would like to do is somehow get a handle on this x plus a term because notice that this absolute value of x minus a term is exactly what we need over here in the definition. So let's just say what if delta was equal to 1. Now, most likely our epsilon challenge will require a much smaller delta than one, but just for the ease of calculation, we're just gonna look at the setup when delta equals one and see what happens. So if delta equals one, then absolute value of x minus a is going to be less than one, which is the same thing as the compound inequality, x minus a is between negative one and one. But now notice that that is the same thing as x being between a plus one and a minus one. Now this is not super helpful yet, but it will be helpful if we can use this to get a handle on this absolute value of x minus a term, sorry, plus a term. So what I'll do is I'll add a to all three parts of that inequality. That's going to give me 2a is less than 1, which is less than x plus a, which is less than 2a plus 1. But we want to change that into something having to do with absolute value of x plus a. But we don't really know what a is, so we can't get a handle on which is bigger, 2a minus 1 or 2a plus 1. And obviously I mean their absolute value because we're going to take an absolute value here. But we can be okay with that just by saying that absolute value of x plus a is going to be less than the maximum of those two. So I'm going to put here max 
of 2a minus 1 and 2a plus 1, and I need to put each of those in absolute values. So definitely if x plus a is between these two numbers, then when you take their absolute value, um, it will be less than the maximum of the absolute value of those two numbers. Just think if like x plus a is between negative 10 and four, for instance, then when you take the absolute value, it is going to be less than 10 because we took the absolute value of that negative 10. That was the maximum there. Okay, good. But now notice that this thing, which is blue underlined, can in essence be replaced with this maximum thing. But then after being replaced with that maximum thing, we can go ahead and divide it over. And then we have a good thing because our X minus A will be by itself. And that gives us a good choice for Delta. Okay, so let's use everything that we've done over there to jump into the rest of the proof. So given epsilon bigger than zero, let's go ahead and take delta equal to the minimum of these two numbers. So it's gonna be the minimum of one and epsilon over the maximum of absolute value of 2a plus one and absolute value of 2a minus one. So now let's go ahead and see why this is going to work. So let's suppose that absolute value of X minus A is less than Delta. But now notice that this means that the absolute value of X minus A is going to be less than each of these. Because we can think about Delta being set equal to the minimum really gives us this and statement involving absolute values. So absolute value X minus A is less than one and absolute value of x minus a is less than this epsilon over this weird maximum thing. So let's go ahead and write that down. So this epsilon over the max of the absolute value of 2a, I'm just gonna put plus or minus one to make it a little bit shorter. And that's in absolute values. Okay, so now we wanna work each of these things out until we get back to x squared minus a squared less than epsilon. And essentially what we're going to do is follow these in reverse. So here we can take this x minus a in absolute values being less than one. And notice that this implies that absolute value of x plus a is going to be less than the maximum of absolute value of 2a plus or minus 1. And I should say that this step from here to here is just exactly this calculation from here to here. So I won't repeat it. You can just kind of reference that calculation over there. Okay, and now the next thing that we can do is notice that the absolute value of x squared minus a squared will be equal to the absolute value of x minus a times the absolute value of x plus a. Good, but then we know that the absolute value of x minus a is less than delta, but now we're gonna use this part of the definition of delta. So we know that this is gonna be less than epsilon over the maximum of absolute value of 2a plus minus one, but then absolute value of x plus a is going to be less than that maximum, but that's in the numerator. So I'll go ahead and write that down. So maximum of absolute value of 2a plus minus one. But now reducing this right-hand side of the inequality, we see that that is equal to epsilon. So we have achieved our goal given an arbitrary epsilon bigger than zero. We have found our delta and shown that if x minus a is less than delta, then x squared minus a squared, in other words, f of x minus f of a is less than epsilon, which means we finished this proof. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and clean up the board and we're gonna look at an example of a function that is nowhere continuous. Now we're gonna look at a pretty classic example of a function that is discontinuous everywhere, but it's gonna be defined over all of the real numbers. So we're gonna define this function f from r to r by the following rule. So f of x is equal to one if x is a rational number, and it's equal to zero if x is an irrational number. So in other words, if x is not in q or it's in the complement of q. So in other words, r minus q. We're gonna use the following fact which was proven previously in, a, in the course, and that is if x is a real number, 
then there is a sequence of rational numbers that converges to x. The important thing here is that x is any real number, including an irrational number. And this can actually be true also if we replace q with r minus q. So in other words, all real numbers are limits of sequences of rational numbers and also limits of sequences of irrational numbers. Okay, so the claim that we're going to make is that for all a, which are real numbers, um, f is discontinuous at a. We're only going to prove one case of this, the case when a is irrational, but I'll leave it to you guys to check the other case. It's pretty much the same. So let's go ahead and suppose that a is in r minus q. Great. And then take this sequence x sub n contained in q such that x sub n converges to a as n goes to infinity. So this kind of thing is possible because of our fact. And now we're going to notice two facts which are inconsistent with this sequential definition of continuity. And those two facts are as follows. So we have f of x sub n is going to be equal to 1 for all natural numbers n. And that's because each of these x sub n's are rational numbers. And we know if we evaluate this function at a rational number, we get 1. So this implies immediately that the limit as n goes to infinity of x of f of x sub n is equal to 1 because it's just the limit of a constant sequence. So that's the first fact. And then the second fact is that f of a is equal to 0. Good. But what that tells us, we can put these two things together and see that this means that the limit as n goes to infinity of f of x sub n is not equal to f of a because 0 is not equal to 1. But that means that this condition for sequential continuity is not satisfied, which is equivalent to this notion of just regular continuity. So in other words, f is discontinuous at this a. So in other words, what we've shown here is that f is discontinuous at every irrational number. And I'll leave it to you guys to use the other version of this fact, which is like kind of built into this pink writing over here, to show that f is discontinuous at every rational number as well. And that's a good place to stop.